So I'm Gabriel DeLuca. I'm a consultant neurologist and a clinician scientist in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences. And I'm going to take the baton from Chris in his excellent talk looking at common diseases and give you a clinical example from the front lines about a rare disease of the nervous system where I think that you're going to see how personalized medicine will play an important role in the near future. But before I launch into that, what is the definition of a rare disease? Well, the European Medicines Agency has launched this definition which describes rare diseases as life-threatening or chronically debilitating conditions that affect less than one in 2,000 people in the UK. So while these diseases individually are infrequently occurring in the population, collectively they're relatively common. So if you think about that, greater than 5% of the population has a rare disease, and that translates into over 3.5 million people in the United Kingdom. And as of now, there are about over 6,000 rare diseases and several more that will be discovered. So you can see the challenges right up front, the challenge to develop drugs and medical devices to prevent, diagnose, and treat these, these, these very rare conditions. So what do we use from a genetic point of view in the clinic to help diagnose these rare diseases? Well, one approach involves targeted sequencing. So let's say you have a patient coming to your clinic who has a suspected disease. Well, what you can do is sequence a specific number of genes or areas in the genome that you think may be related to that disease. Now, this is obviously very targeted and it will reduce costs and time, but you're really at the expense of having a limited number of genes that are evaluated. What if it's not one of those genes that you test? You won't have an answer. And so, as was covered by Professor Donnelly, there are other techniques and strategies that can be used. Now, while targeted sequencing is used in a subset of conditions and funded by the NHS, these others are not. They're relatively inaccessible, except if you're in a research milieu. So what about whole exome sequencing? Well, an exome essentially is a protein coding region of the genome, and it constitutes about 1% of the genome. And so, this is more cost effective than sequencing all three billion base pairs. But what if there isn't a variant in the protein coding region that's important for that disease? Well, you won't detect that. And what if that's important in the manifestation of the disease? Then you'll be left without an answer. Then finally, the most comprehensive and expensive is whole genome sequencing, where you evaluate all of the DNA base pairs in the genome. And this, of course, as I said, is expensive and certainly not wildly available. But what does this mean for a clinician in the front line? And I'm going to give you an example as a neurologist of a case that's really a success story here in Oxford in terms of diagnosis and will illustrate the power of how genetics can influence how we look at patients and care for them. So I present to you a seven-year-old boy who had no significant past medical history. And on a cursory review, there was no known family history of any medical disease. And the reason why this boy comes to the clinic is because he has significant motor delay and he has problems with cognition. So when you hear that story, the first thing that the neurologist will do is take a very detailed developmental history. What happened from birth and how did that patient develop? Well, this is a summary of the developmental history here. So things were not right, right from birth. The baby was extremely floppy. Typically, infants have a flexed tone. The baby was floppy. The baby was only able to sit at 10 months, which is rather delayed. It should have happened by five months. Only started to crawl at 18 months, when that should have had a milestone reached at nine months was pulling to stand at 20 months when should have done that in half the time. And imagine only being able to walk and with a walker at five years of age when that should have been done after about 12 months. And accompanying that striking profile, while you have a two-year-old who can join two words together, this patient was only able to start doing that at the age of five. 
and the ramifications in terms of the scholastic studying and the individual support that we required were baffling. So then we inquired about what was going on really in the family. Well, we reveal here a family tree where it's noted that the parents are actually related to one another. They're actually first cousins. So this is the patient, the seven-year-old boy I just presented. And these are the parents who have a relationship through these link here. So they're first cousins. But then we probe further and we ask about other family members that may have diseases. And so what we learn is that two first cousins of the patient had almost an identical clinical history where they were born floppy and didn't start walking and needed assistance with walking at five years of age and had significant cognitive problems. And here are those two cousins related to that patient here. So the question is, well, what is going on that's causing these children having difficulty with coordination and walking and causing their clinical deficits cognitively? Well, whenever I show a slide that shows some anatomy, it usually induces an itchy rash to medical students, but I'll make this very brief. But when we think of problems with coordination, we think of disorders that affect the cerebellum. And that's highlighted here in orange. And the cerebellum is a really crucial structure for coordinating your limb movements, maintaining postural stability, your ability to walk, but also it's important for motion, cognition, and language. So could it be that there's a problem with the cerebellum that's causing the symptoms that both this child and his first cousins had? Well, one way to do this analysis is by looking at the brain by getting an MRI scan. So on the left, this is what a normal MRI scan should look like, okay? So this is cut sagittally down the middle this way. And if we're looking onto the side, and this is the cerebellum, as we saw from the schematic the slide before. Now, we look at our patient at seven years of age, and the first thing we look at is the cerebellum, and it doesn't look too bad. It actually looks pretty normal. Now, don't worry about this stuff here. That's actually okay. It's just the way the, the image was taken. But if we look here, this is a structure called the corpus callosum that joins the right and left side of the brain. And what you see very obviously is that there's something quite wrong here. And it's a perplexing finding. So what one did was dug into the family history and, and tried to see whether or not there are MRI scans from the cousins. And so here again, we have a normal MRI scan. And we had one of the cousins and their MRI scan at six years of age and later at 16 years of age, the same cousin. What do we see? Well, paying attention to the cerebellum, well, this is starting to look a bit shrunken. It doesn't look quite normal. But the corpus callosum looks OK. That's different at the same age, which is interesting. But then 10 years pass, and you can definitely see how this cerebellum has shrunk in size rather significantly. And again, the corpus callosum looks relatively preserved. So how could it be that this family with a very similar clinical phenotype has very different profiles on imaging? Is there a genetic basis for this? And if so, why would it be so different between cousins? Well, as you can imagine, the story is perplexing. And this led to multiple outpatient and inpatient visits for all three family members. Now look at how many professionals were seen here in the medical community. Multiple GPs, pediatricians, <clears throat> pediatric neurologists, subspecialty pediatric and adult neurologists who specialize in these disorders of coordination such as ataxia, and clinical geneticists. But what's more striking, the innumerable laboratory and clinical tests that these young children have gone through, multiple blood samples, lumbar punctures for cerebral spinal fluid, urine samples, electromyography where you take a stick, a needle, and you go into muscles and record activity, or shock nerves to get nerve conduction studies. And imagine going through all of that and the investigations are normal. And no diagnosis is reached. An incredibly frustrating and meandering procedure to get to really no answer that families beg to have. So this is really where 
research centers where we have a link between the NHS and the academic centers like Oxford, we're very lucky. And this is a, an important Oxford story where we have an ataxia center here, where it really is a, a striking example of how research communities and clinical communities are aligning to really affect patient care in a positive way. And as a part of this center, this boy came with his family and they were offered genetic testing for several neurodevelopmental conditions, over 100 genes that are available on a panel. And what they found was a mutation in this one gene, SPTBN2. And Dr. Andrea Nemeth has been an important leader in this, along with my colleagues, Professor Talbot and Zam Kader, in leading to understanding what an important panel is and interpreting what these mutations mean. But what about this particular mutation? Well, it encodes a specific protein called beta-3 spectrin, and it's known to cause a very rare disease called spinocerebellar ataxia type 5. So what does that mean? Well, we know that these spectrum mutations can cause this disorder, and it's extremely rare. It's been found in three families, and it's autosomal dominant, meaning that you inherit one copy from a, from a parent, and then you inherit that copy to get the disease. Now, it's been described in three families, an American family, and actually the family that President Abraham Lincoln has descendancy from. They weren't related to President Lincoln that they knew of, and also a French and German family. But the characteristics of this disease were very different in that this disease starts in adulthood and only involves problems with coordination, and there's no problems with cognition. So clearly, this is not the same syndrome, but yet it's the same gene that seems to be implicated. But when you have two parents who are related, could there be different mutations that cause it a, a phenotype that is so dramatically different? And so what they found was not only did these children have one of the inherited mutations for spectrum, but they in fact inherit, inherited two. And so one would think, could this be some form of an autosomal recessive disease that leads to a much more severe phenotype? But what's remarkable about this story is that we often think when patients are related that we have to go beyond that gene because what has been described doesn't involve problems with cognition. And in fact, on a research basis for these patients, they had whole genome sequencing and they compared the DNAs between the, the affected child, the cousins, and the parents and they couldn't find anything else other than this gene, the fact that they had these two bad copies of the gene in the same patient. They went on to look in the laboratory in a mouse model and found when you take out this gene, if you knock it out, make it dysfunctional or not express any protein, that not only do they have problems in their cerebellum, they have problems in other parts that are important for memory. And so all of a sudden, that really was a striking observation that led to a new diagnosis in this child and the two cousins called SPARCA1, spectrum-associated autosomal recessive ataxia type 1, which has early onset of motor coordination difficulties, problems with, with developmental delay in both cognition and language, and these MRI abnormalities that are not necessarily consistent between the individuals. So what are the conclusions here? Well, Rare diseases can be complex, and because of their complexity, they can evade definitive diagnosis. As illustrated here, clinical phenotypes are extremely variable, and they can be sometimes difficult to recognize. And imagine the nervous system. It's relatively inaccessible, making the challenge that much greater. The diagnostic odyssey, the multiple consultations, the multiple tests, and no guaranteed answers, and what implications that can have on the patient, most importantly, and their family. And this is where really we are excited as a clinical community about the prospect of genomics and personalized medicine in playing an increasingly important role in establishing diagnoses, in understanding the pathophysiology of disease, in developing targeted and patient-specific therapies, but it's going to be complicated and at least at the very beginning, we're not going to have all of our answers. So with that illustrative case, I'm going to leave you with some questions to consider. Should all patients with a rare disease have this level of genetic testing? 
what is the value of arriving at a diagnosis where there are no treatment options? And how do we systematically start cataloging very diverse clinical phenotypes and relating them to genetic data to help diagnose and treat patients? And with that, I will leave you and introduce back in Ingrid, who will look at pharmacogenomics and cancer care. Thank you.